everybody. Today's practice problem comes from Economics, 4th edition, by R. Glenn Hubbard and Anthony Patrick O'Brien. Today we're going to be doing chapter 5, problem number 4.4. The problem begins by saying, suppose that Jill and Joe are the only two people in the small town of Andover. Andover has land available to build a park of no more than nine acres. Jill and Joe's demand schedule for the park are as follows. And then we have this information here. And then it says also the supply of parks looks like the following. And notice that in each case we have price and the quantities are in number of acres. So it's not literally saying how many parks do you want, but how many acres do you want your park to be? And then part A of the question says to draw a graph showing the optimal size of the park. So in order to do that, we need to actually take a step back and think about the structure or the features that this park has in terms of economic features of the market and also what this all means and how we can actually aggregate up from the individual quantity demands or the individual willingness to pay of Joe and Jill to some sort of market demand curve. Okay. So notice here what we're saying for Joe and Jill individually is that at a price of $10, Joe doesn't, he's not willing to pay $10 for any acreage. But once the price drops to nine, then he wants one acres of park. If the price were to drop to eight, he would want two acres of park, and so on and so forth. So it's worth remembering that this demand schedule actually gives not only quantity demanded, but if we think about it backwards, actually gives us what we could call marginal willingness to pay, or willingness to pay for that last unit. Because we could simply say here that Joe's willingness to pay for the first unit or the first acre of park is $9. His willingness to pay for the second acre of park is $8. Because that's where he flips over from demanding one acre to demanding two acres. His willingness to pay for the third acre is $7. And so on and so forth. And we could say the same thing for Jill here. Now normally when we have what we would call private goods that have high excludability, meaning they can be restricted to paying customers, and also high rivalry in consumption, meaning that if I'm consuming a particular unit of a good, another person can't fully consume that same unit, then we would do what we call horizontal addition, right? That so we could say, well, at a price of $8, let's say, the Joe demands two acres of park, and Jill demands seven acres of park. Therefore, between the two of them, they demand nine acres of park. That that's normally what we would do, right? Though we said that typically to go from individual demands to market demands, we look at every price and then add up the quantities demanded. Now, because this is a park, that's not quite what we want to do. Because, you know, think about a park that if we have a given acreage of park for Joe, does Jill really need her own park to be able to fully consume the benefits of that park? Probably not. So here we have the park having low rivalry in consumption, meaning that Joe consuming the park doesn't really inhibit Jill from consuming that same acreage of park, right? So we don't necessarily need to add their quantities and what we actually do instead is called vertical addition rather than horizontal addition, strangely enough. Because what we're really saying, let's flip this on its head, is that Joe values this first acre of park at $9. Jill values this first acre of park at $14. And if they can both consume this first acre of park, then collectively this first acre of park is worth 9 plus 14 or $23 to them. See how that works? Similarly, we could say, oh hey look, Jill values a second acre of park at $13. Joe values a second acre of park at $8. And since they can both consume fully that second acre of park, we can say that collectively 
the societal benefits, since these are the only two people in the society, the societal benefits to the second acre of park are 8 plus 13, or $21. And we could keep going in that way, and we could come up with the overall societal benefits from this park, which would give the market demand curve for the park's acres, but would do so by adding these willingness to pays or these prices vertically, rather than doing the horizontal addition where we had to add the quantities as we saw in the market for private goods. So we can make a market demand curve here, where what we're really measuring is the amount of societal benefit created for each acre of park, right? Because the societal benefit should be the collective willingness to pay because people are willing to pay their valuation or their benefits that they get from consuming the item. So what I did here is I just said, well, I'm just going to line up the quantities from zero to nine because I noticed that each of the individuals has quantities of zero to nine. And then we can just go through and for each quantity add the willingness to pay us because that's just adding up the valuations of the two individuals in that society. So if we were to do that, we would see here, it doesn't really make sense to add up for zero acres of park, but we'll just do it nonetheless. We get $25. For this first acre of park, like we said, Joe had a valuation of $9. Jill had a valuation of $14. And of course, valuation and willingness to pay are the same thing. So collectively, they value the first acre of park at $23. They value the second acre of park at 8 plus 13, or $21. They value the third acre of park at 7 plus 12, or $19. They value the fourth acre of park at 6 plus 11, or $17. They value the fifth acre of park at 5 plus 10, or $15. They value the sixth acre of park at 9 plus 4, or $13. They value the seventh acre of park at 8 plus 3, or $11. They value the eighth acre of park at 7 plus 2, or $9. And they value the ninth unit of park at six plus one, or seven dollars. So what we have here is a measure of the benefits to society that are created from each additional unit of park. So we could say that each one of these numbers represents the marginal benefit to each additional acre of park. Now, in order to figure out what's optimal, obviously we have to put demand and supply together. And it's worth remembering that here, when we talk about the demand, we're measuring the benefits to society or the marginal benefits to society. And when we're talking about supply, we're measuring marginal cost or the cost, the cost of society. So here, rather than putting societal benefits, I'm gonna put societal costs, and we can infer from this supply curve, because this is just what supply curves tell us, is that this first acre of park costs $11. The second acre of park has a marginal cost of $13. The third acre of park has a marginal cost of $15, and so on and so forth. So we can actually go through, and we can graph our demand and our supply and actually use that to figure out what the optimal number of acres of park should be. So I'm not gonna graph this to scale on the board just because that's kind of annoying. So let's pause for a second. I'll put up an overlay of what these numbers look like to scale here for you to look at. Okay, so now that you've seen those, you can see you know, where those supply and demand curves intersect. We could also just go through the logic here to figure out, even if we're not going to explicitly graph the supply and demand to scale, though we can think about where this intersection point is going to be. So we can think about, well, this first acre of park brings benefits to society of $23. 
and cost society $11. So we could ask ourselves, should this first acre of park be built? Well, the marginal benefits outweigh the marginal costs. So yeah, it makes sense for this second, or for this first unit, first acre of park to be built. And we could continue asking this question, right? Because what this equilibrium is doing with the supply and demand diagram is it's telling us that we want to produce all those units where the marginal benefits outweigh the marginal costs, and then we want to stop where that's no longer true. So what we're really looking for is our equilibrium quantity here, or our socially optimal quantity, is that quantity where the marginal benefit to society equals the marginal cost to society. So we can keep going, and we can say the second park brings marginal benefits of $21 and costs $13. Yeah, that seems like a good trade-off. That acre of park should be built. This third acre of park brings benefits to society of $19, and cost society $15. Oh yeah, marginal benefit still outweighs marginal cost. This third acre seems like a good idea. This fourth acre of park brings benefits mar on the margin of $17 and has a marginal cost of $17. Technically speaking, we're societally indifferent between having this last acre of park and not having it. But let's just say for the sake of argument that we have that fourth acre of park it's not going to hurt us. In contrast, this fifth acre of park is specifically going to be bad for society because it's only worth $15 to society, but it's going to cost $19 to produce. So if we were to produce this fifth acre of park, what we would actually be doing is reducing societal welfare by $4. We don't want to do that. And we can see that this socially optimal acreage of this park is in fact four acres. So we could say here that the intersection of the marginal social benefits, which is what the demand curve is giving, and the marginal social cost, which is what the supply curve is giving, is in fact four acres. And we could also put a price on that. The associated price is obviously just $17. And we could see from this graph, just putting this into the supply and demand framework, we would see the same thing, that a quantity of four acres is the size of park that is in fact optimal for this very small society. The second part of the question just asks us to briefly explain why a park of two acres is not optimal. So, you know, the easy sort of trivial answer would be, well, a park of two acres is not optimal because two isn't four and four is optimal. But we can do better than that. We can say, well, if we were to stop at this two acre park, we're leaving some net benefits to society on the table, right? So we're saying, well, if we're stopping at two, then we're explicitly saying no to this third acre, which has benefits to society that are strictly greater than the costs to produce this acre. So, well, wait a minute, we're leaving something on the table there. We're not producing something where the benefits to society outweigh the costs. Therefore, stopping early, stopping at this two-acre park, is not going to be optimal because we haven't produced everything for society where the marginal benefits to society outweigh the marginal cost of society.